Jim Solms Group. I'll uh, be your MC for this evening, so we're really looking forward to getting started. Um, to kick us off, I'd like to invite uh, Meg Lusardi from Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources to say a few words of welcome. Thank you, Neil. Um, it's great to be here in Northampton once again. Jim Berry, who's your regional coordinator, was unable to be here this evening and he sends his regrets, so I thought that I would come out from Boston and be here because I always love coming to Northampton. Um, on behalf of the DBR Green Communities Division and Mass CEC, um, who we have the pleasure of you know, partnering together with on this initiative, I just want to welcome you all here this evening. And I want to congratulate you on this turnout. This is impressive, and you know I still see people coming in. But you know, in all honesty, I'm not surprised because this is Northampton. You know, you guys have been leading the way for quite some time. When you were one of our very first green communities, one of our very first 35, you've been recognized by us as a leading by example municipality. Mr. Chris Mason over here was the first individual to receive the Leading by Example Award for someone who works with municipalities. You're wrapping up the Solarize Mass uh, initiative right now. And then you took the initiative and applied for this program, the Community Energy Strategies Planning Program. And so, you know, we're really glad that you did that and, you know, grateful to be able to work with you on this initiative. But, you know, I think it's important to note that Northampton has demonstrated its commitment to clean energy for a long time. We're here in an energy efficient building here this evening. Um, but you guys have been walking the walk and talking the talk long before there was a Green Communities Division and long before there was a Mass Clean Energy Center. So I think it's important to note that you know, we are learning from you as much as you know, we're here helping. And I, you know, and that's one of the things that I always say, you know, in the Green Communities Division, and as we, you know, are partnering here with CEC tonight, is that, you know, we provide the tools and the technical assistance for you, but you guys do the work. You know, you guys are the ones that are making change happen. You're creating change right here and now for yourselves and for generations to come. And so I applaud you for that, and you know we are really happy to be able to be partnering with you um, on this pilot. And just a couple of things before um, I turn it over to others who are going to walk you through the process for this evening. That uh, just a couple of notes I want to leave you with is that this is your clean energy action plan. You know, once again, we're here to provide technical assistance and to help you create it, and then we'll be here to help you implement it. But the content is all yours. So I think it's important to note that. And then secondly, you know, I mentioned that this is a pilot. And so we want to learn from you. So as you're doing this, we want to know what has worked well, what has not worked so well. Because the only way that we're going to be able to determine the best, you know, next steps is to learn from all of you. So, I just want to recognize a few people here this evening. I know, where did Rachel Ackerman go? She's from Mass CEC, and she's been key on moving this uh, program along. And then, Catherine Finneran, who's the director of Re a Clean Energy at Mass CEC. And then, some of other, our other state colleagues and partners here, um, Sarah Weinstein from Mass DEP, and Dan Hall from Mass DEP. Always want to recognize our colleagues. And then I also want to take a minute to recognize the working group here in Northampton because, so if you who are on the working group could stand up and be recognized, you're the ones that brought everybody here this evening and have been doing the day-to-day -day work. Great, so with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Neil. Thanks, Meg. Um, so welcome, everybody. We uh, have had a really good time, I think, working with all of you over the past several weeks in uh, helping to shape the emerging uh, community energy strategy for, for Northampton. And we really look forward to working with you uh, tonight and in the weeks going forward to uh, whip this thing into shape. Um, so I am moving in the wrong direction here. There we go. Um, so before we get sort of too far down the road here, I'd just like to step back and think about uh, walk through the process that's at play for this uh, program. Sort of where we've been, what we've done so far, uh, and where we're headed in the future with regard to the process. 
Uh, so this slide uh, lays out um, sort of the three main steps in the development of the uh, community energy strategy for, for Northampton. Um, so I think as uh, Meg mentioned, uh, Northampton applied several months ago for the program from MassCC to receive uh, technical assistance from uh, our organization, Meister Consultants Group, as well as a number of other consultants who are providing technical resources uh, and GIS assistance. Um, we additionally collectively developed a working group for the community, which uh, Meg introduced a number of them earlier tonight. Uh, now the working group really serves as the decision-making authority uh, for this entire roadmap. So as ideas have developed, uh, they've been the ones to sort of point out, this is the direction we want to go, or this is not the direction, or maybe we'll put these ideas on hold. But the working group's really been driving outreach, they've been serving as ambassadors, and uh, serving as decision makers for, for the roadmap as it's developed. Um, so at the very first forum, uh, the working group invited a number of folks uh, to get together and uh, open it up to the general public, and we heard a lot of great ideas about the types of uh, projects or programs and goals uh, that Northampton had in mind uh, for the uh, community energy strategies. And uh, as that uh, program wrapped up, at that first forum wrapped up, we aggregated all those ideas. And I think in total there was, I lose track, but I think about uh, 70 to 100 uh, different uh, project and program ideas that emerged out of that. Um, and we aggregated that into a clean energy inventory, which the working group reviewed uh, in detail. Uh, and the working group identified uh, 18 projects that they thought represented a really good starting point for moving forward. And you'll see around the room there's uh, these boards laid out. Uh, and those 18 uh, projects uh, sort of have been listed as a starting point uh, for further discussion for the roadmap. Um, so later tonight, we'll have an opportunity to sort of look at these uh, projects. And we'll be looking to listen from, to, to all of you regarding which projects you really want to prioritize, which ones you think uh, sort of are most compelling to begin with, um, and uh, that will provide us some helpful feedback in thinking about what, what kinds of projects you're most excited about. Um, so that brings us to tonight, the, the 201 form will we'll, uh, look at those specific projects, uh, and uh, additionally the working group has identified four projects in particular that they think are, are worthy of more detailed feedback uh, from all of you tonight. And those four are uh, energy efficiency, anaerobic digestion, landfill solar, uh, and bike sharing. Um, and so based on the working group's uh, suggestions, we've invited four experts uh, to speak to all of you tonight, uh, uh, sort of listen to your ideas or, or respond to your questions, and provide some real technical expertise in thinking through what might these particular projects look like. Uh, but we'll get to that a little bit later tonight. Uh, so sit tight for that. Um, and then going forward, um, as I mentioned, MassCC is providing some technical resources in the, in the form of GIS analysis uh, or feasibility or pre-feasibility studies, economic analysis on any one of these, these projects. Uh, and so that will help put a little bit more meat on the bones as to what will ultimately emerge as the, for, as the roadmap for, for Northampton. Um, it's important to note this is an iterative process. You sort of gather feedback, do a little bit of analysis, gather more feedback, and ultimately the working group and all of you uh, shape the, the roadmap that makes the best sense for the community. Um, does that generally make sense to everybody? Good. Um, well, let's uh, charge ahead. Uh, with that, I'd, I'd like to invite uh, Chris Mason up, uh, and he will give you a brief overview of those 18 projects that the working group uh, identified uh, based on your initial feedback at the one-on-one forum. Uh, and we can go from there. Chris. Thank you, <coughs> thank you Neil. Um, I also want to uh, just say a general thank you to the Mass Clean Energy Center and um, the D Department of Energy Resources. I feel honored that we have the director of the Green Communities Department came out to Northampton for us this already. She's the one that gives us our green grant, community grants. <laughs> so she gives us money. <laughs> and says wonderful things. And says wonderful things for us and actually has developed a beautiful a great community of communities through the Green Communities program. I think it's a, a very, very successful program and I'm really happy that Northampton is part of it. Um, uh, okay, I'm gonna uh, see if I can so tonight as you know there's there four of these ideas were selected to go over in depth. And I'm gonna go over the uh, the other 
uh, 18 or so uh, ideas that we've had, and I'm going to not only describe them quickly, but put them in context uh, for Northampton. Um, uh, and I just want to say that um, <clears throat> as I go through my presentation, during the time when we are putting stickies out, we're identifying, uh, you guys are identifying your top priorities. We really do want to know what the community is feeling about these ideas. Um, at that time, uh, we'll be wandering around other people. If, if you have any in-depth questions, feel free to grab us and pit, uh, pitch and hold us, or uh, send emails, or contact us afterwards. During my presentation, if you have any clarifying questions, I'd be happy to answer any clarifying questions, but I don't want to uh, get sidetracked in, in going into anything in, in depth, okay? So with that, um, let's see, I guess, oh, are you uh, getting, very good. Okay, so, um, first one we have on uh, the renewable energy piece. Uh, a couple of these, um, uh, on the upper left up here, the solar, wait, well, actually, wait a minute. So the city has already incorporated solar ready, and uh, as you know, we're seeing great success with the Solarize program, the two you see on the right over here. Uh, so we've done a lot with uh, solar ready um, uh, in the zoning. Uh, there's probably more regulatory things that we could, we could do. Uh, the Solarize program, I'd like to announce right now that we've got uh, 94 contracts uh, as of right now for over 600 kilowatts. We are over a half a megawatt of installed solar that is going to go into Northampton through this program. So wonderful, fantastic success um, uh, with that program. And the idea of uh, expanding this out to a Solarize 201 makes a lot of sense. Uh, so these are ones that are just going to fit with what Northampton's doing, and we are very happy to take these further. Um, the upper left, the solar canopies, uh, that is one uh, right now. The, so the zoning has actually got solar, solar canopies are as of right in Northampton, so we're already um, uh, kind of promoting those. Um, and we're hearing from the state that the next uh, incentive program for renewables is going to highlight uh, like things like solar canopies over parking lots. So this might be a really good time to bring this in. Uh, so this, this actually fits well with where we may want to go. Um, uh, uh, lastly, our, our, the GIS mapping, or actually to say just the, the mapping exercise that Mass CEC and our other partners are helping, with, are helping us to identify where maybe some of the place, best places for that would be in Northampton. So that's already kind of moving forward a little bit. Um, the bottom left, middle, uh, hydroelectric power, it must have been two or three decades ago that Northampton had a study of hydroelectric uh, power, and nothing really happened since then, so this could very well be timely for us to relook at this. Don't know exactly what's changed. Um, and that leaves the uh, two uh, blue areas, which are going to have a direct focus on tonight, the solar on a local landfill and community smoke, solar anaerobic digestion. Um, the solar on the local landfill, uh, you know, our, our landfill is just being capped. Uh, it again, I'm hearing that the next phase of the SREC program, or the program that's supporting solar, uh, very well may support brownfields and landfills over other sites. So again, it may be very uh, timely for us to work on this initiative. Um, the anaerobic digestion is something that we are hearing a lot about in the area, a way of reducing waste going to landfills to provide a non-fossil fuel-based fuel. Uh, it can support local agriculture by giving them a, a lower cost option for getting rid of their waste. Um, however, it's new and the city you know, could use some education on it, so uh, tonight I think it's really well worth it for us to learn more about this, and tonight we're going to have an opportunity to ask some questions about it. The next one's energy efficiency. Um, so we have up in the upper middle the stretch code, which is something that Northampton has adopted. Our sustainable Northampton plan called for us to uh, aim for the highest efficiency building code we can. So the stretch code is um, is going to be re initiated uh, re. There's going to be a new stretch code coming out, and I feel sure that Northampton is going to put that in front of City Council and look to adopt it again. Um, the ones in the upper, I said the bottom, uh, middle, and the upper right, bottom, middle, upper right, 
the LED street lighting and building energy disclosure, disclosure ordinances. Um, right now, LED uh, street lighting, um, uh, the, again, these consultants are already helping us to identify, get our, our, our current lighting better mapped out in our backing system. So it's going to make it easier for us to, to work on that. Uh, North, North National Grid has recently passed a rate tariff. It's a way that we pay for streetlights, which finally allows us to actually earn a little income or, or pay a little bit less for LED lights. Uh, it hasn't been available for, for a long time. That is now in place. Um, the Energy Commission, and actually, I actually wouldn't mind taking a moment to mention North Afton does have an Energy and Sustainability Commission that along with the working group puts a lot of effort in on this. And I'm going to take a moment to recognize the Energy Commission. We have commissioners who are here. Okay. Do you want to stand up just real quickly? They help us uh, on an uh, ongoing basis with energy efficiency. <laughs> the last thing I want to do with the LED streetlights is that we're actually working with National Grid. We're, in a couple of weeks, we're going to bring National Grid's going to come here to do a a general training for municipalities on LED streetlights and other efficiency measures they have for municipalities. So, uh, so once again, that's one that really fits in place uh, for us. The uh, Building Energy Disclosure Ordinance is, is uh, a highly interesting one. It's been successful in some large communities. Uh, this could be, I mean, you could actually put a couple of bullets underneath this one because it could be implemented in many different ways. So I'm fascinated with the city looking at this type of, uh, of a measure myself. Um, the bottom right, PACE, I'm going to have to take here, I'm just going to assume people don't know what PACE financing is, Property Assessed Clean Energy Financing. It's a technique where a municipal government would provide a low interest bond to a private landowner or private property owner to do energy efficiency or renewable improvements on their, on their building. The, the, um, the payment uh, would be paid back on a, as a tax assessment on the building. So the payment doesn't get attached to the owner, it gets attached to the building. So that if you're investing in something really long-term, that has a long-term payback, that if you move, the next owner takes over. It's a way of sharing payments over, over many owners. Um, uh, it has many other benefits, and that's, I'm just going to leave it at that because I don't have time to go into the depth. But Northampton is the only municipality in Massachusetts that has the city council has enabled us to develop a PACE program. The state came up with something in 2010 that said the municipalities can do this. Northampton's the only one that adopted it. We tried for various reasons. We weren't able to get a program in place. There's current state legislation moving forward that would overcome those problems. And Northampton is really looking forward to it, particularly for uh, commercial and industrial properties. There's some federal rulings that have kind of put it on hold for residential, unfortunately. Um, but this is an exciting new way of financing energy efficiency. The state's goals, um, uh, Northampton is looking at a goal, 80% greenhouse gas reductions by 2050. That's primarily trying to say you're moving away from fossil fuels, 80% reduction from fossil fuels by 2050. That's a huge lift, and we have wonderful utility programs uh, in the state. We have great uh, state support uh, in the state. And yet, in order to make that huge lift, private investment's going to have to come in. And uh, PACE financing is a way to really open up some private investments in our own buildings in order to get to that really heavy lift done. So I, we see that as a very important piece. Uh, lastly, the, uh, the one in the blue background, Energy Efficiency Marketing and Implementation <laughs> Campaign. Um, really high priority for the working group. Uh, and an area that came up in the first forum over and over and over again, education and outreach, education and outreach, from not just energy efficiency, but for across the board. So this is one that's, this, it's, it's, it's a sticky one to, uh, to address, a typical one to address, but I'm really glad that it's, it's, it's here for us to look at. Okay, next one, uh, the transportation. Investigating uh, public charging stations, uh, electric vehicles, um, working with uh, Mass ADC and MISER, uh, when this popped up as something that the community was interested in, um, they dug up some information on, uh, for us, and I now know that uh, Northampton has the 10th highest number of registered electric vehicles in the state, of all communities. We have the 10th highest number of registered hybrid cars in the state. I didn't know that, and now I do. So 
Uh, this one makes a lot of sense for us to look at. So I, obviously I think that's a, a good one to keep in there for sure. Um, uh, in, uh, improved services at regional state level for ride sharing, uh, bus routes and train service and stuff. Uh, the working group highlighted this as their top priority. When we looked at uh, focusing on it here, we said it's one that we don't have a lot of direct control over. We can do a lot of advocating. So for that, we went with the next runner up, which was really quite high as well, the bike share initiative. Uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, and yet, obviously, the working group felt that you know, lobbying for um, uh, state ride share, sharing program bus routes and stuff was a really high priority for Northampton. And I did mention I got an email today from someone who didn't think of the first one, said they had another idea. Uh, so one more idea is going on our list, and it's the idea is to add a shuttle loop throughout North Northampton's communities. I don't know how viable this is, I don't know if it's a work workable idea, but we're going to throw it in the mix too. Um, if you do have ideas, uh, please go ahead and email them in to me at any time. I'd be happy to uh, add new ideas. Okay, we're finally down to our last slide. And we don't have anything to focus on here tonight, but a number of the measures that people came up with not only supported renewable energy and energy efficiency, but they had a second um, uh, objective, or at least a second uh, um, benefit, is that they could help protect Northampton from energy supply disruptions. And Northampton's Energy Commission uh, is not only tasked with doing energy efficiency renewable energy, but it's also tasked with uh, guarding against energy supply disruptions and effects of climate change. So these fit in there. Um, the first one I'm going to go over, uh, district energy. Uh, right now, our electric grid is basically district energy. We get our electricity through lines that come to each of individual houses. We don't make our electricity at home, although we are now more and more with solar. Uh, uh, so the district energy is often referred to as a way of, of piping in heat, and it can be far more efficient than individual burners. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. That's kind of a description of what it is. Feel free to ask for more in-depth questions if, if you have more. Um, uh, the bottom middle, uh, integrating solar PV into street lighting. This is something that I know is happening in New Jersey. And very nicely, a side effect of this, which I never would have thought of until someone brought it up for me, is when you put a PV panel on a, on a telephone pole like that, uh, you need to have a way to communicate how much power is, it, is coming off that and coming, coming you know, so, so you, have to, you, have to, you have to have a communication link on that pole. Once you have a communication link on that pole, if it goes two ways, and you start installing street lights that could be controlled, you now have an opportunity to dim your lights at 1 o'clock in the morning, turn certain lights off when you don't need them. So in the LED uh, street lights that we're talking about, those may start coming up with that kind of technology. Northampton, you know, so this is a whole mix of things. Um, if you go back into emergency preparedness, if you have certain routes where you really need to have that route, you know, if there's an evacuation route or something you have to have lit up, solar may provide a local, you know, opportunity to power those lights when the power goes out. So, a lot of good ideas there, and I'm really glad these ideas are coming up out of the community. Um, return to batteries. Uh, PV systems now are really much more cost-effective and uh, energy-effective because they're using the battery, the, the, you know, the power grid as your big battery. But in some cases, it may be worth it to start sticking on batteries um, to help with uh, emergency management of some kind. You know, so if we could store some energy for when the power goes out, and use that when the power goes out. And the idea over here are local microgrids. A microgrid would be, how do I describe this? When you could take a small section of power lines in a certain area of you know, the community, and when the power goes out, they can island, so that they can rely on local power. And it gives you an opportunity of sharing. If you have generators or solar arrays with batteries on them, you might be able to start having them back, the back, back generators are backing up the backups. Uh, so if one goes down, if the flood comes up and takes out that generator, then your solar array may come in and kind of, kind of help back up that facility that you need in the emergency. Um, and these. Two last ones right here, I want to let you know that Northampton is, um, actually I believe we have inked the contract to work with a, a, an organization to um, investigate our emergency management buildings uh, and, and start looking at a plan to see if, can we use these 
and uh, we'll be working with uh, some other state partners, um, possibly some state partners. Uh, National Grid is involved in this. Uh, so that's something that we are working on, and that would help us identify where we can possibly put these kind of things. And then, of course, we have to find the resources to do it. Um, so that's the 28. I think I've highlighted the ones that you guys are going to be, uh, we're going to have an opportunity to really focus on. And I believe we're going to hand it back over to Neil, but I think what Neil's going to say is that we'd like to hear back from you now. Which ones uh, do you feel really are the high priorities for right now? Okay, Chris. As a clarifying question, can you just give a quick definition of the building energy exposure ordinance? Okay, building energy, I, I can see that coming out in two ways. Uh, for instance, New York City has now a, um, an ordinance for New York City where their top power consuming buildings, and these are really big energy users, are required to reveal how much energy they use. And uh, I've seen the list, it's, it's astounding, like the top 2%, the top 2% 2, 2 biggest buildings use something like 40% of the energy in New York City. It's incredible. Um, but what this has shown is that there's certain buildings that, you know, if you, if, you, if you look at it, in all these certain types of buildings, there's some that use very little energy compared to their, the other ones, and some that use a huge amount more. So, it, but it, so there's one opportunity. Um, the other one might be more on a residential level, where at a point of sale, you would, um, uh, uh, I got the wrong slide up there, sorry, I'm looking back for it. Um, so at a point of sale, that you would, you would be required to reveal the amount of energy use your, your building has, something like that. So there's many different ways it can go, but it's really um, getting at the problem that you can't, you can't address something that you can't measure and you can't see. Uh, so this might be a way to help the community start being able to see some of the energy use um, in the community that gives us a way to help plan to, to address it. Clarifying questions? Yes, clarifying questions. Okay. In um, so, in terms of uh, how, how the committee came to, to choose these items, were there thoughts given to the cost and cost savings for, and, you know, percent of energy that each of these um, strategies use within the community and how much would be saved by implementing them? Um, so, the, the 18 or so ones that I went over. You know, we started off uh, with 125 ideas that were listed. Some of those were goals and visions. So I guess maybe seven or eight, actually, 80 actions. All of those actions, every one of them that was in, kind of worked into these 18 ideas. So these 18 ideas really weren't kind of too much of culling. It was more of a organizing. Uh, so we really haven't lost much of the ideas, uh, except for I mean, someone did suggest hoverboards. So, um, um, so that one got set aside. And, uh, um, um, and then the ones that you aim to focus on here, it was more just a, what do we think would be of interest to find out more information on for tonight? So it wasn't even so much a priority, this is the one we want to pick to go forward. It's like these are the ones we really want to be able to dive in and get some more information on tonight. We haven't done that level of um, analysis on what would be actually saving the most energy. Yes, right. Chris. Um, last, 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 last question. Um, I have um, brought this many times about the solar panels for street lighting. And I'm very happy to see the integrating of the solar PV into street lighting. So I'm hoping that as a city councilor, we can work very closely on the infrastructure of our streets throughout the city. My biggie, which you do know, is the closing of the landfill, and um, we're capping it. And I have been doing some research in regards to what they are doing in East Stampton with solar, which I've talked to you about that. So I am really hoping that we can integrate some type of a plan for the landfill because we're going to be losing, we're losing money, we can generate money. And I know that they are generating money in East Stampton, so I'd like to hear from you of your thoughts of putting solar into that Glendale Road landfill. You know, um, uh, Marianne, I'm, I'm going to actually um, pass that question on. It, there, that's one of the issues that we're going to focus on. So we have some folks here uh, who have a lot of experience with that, and they're going to bring information in, and that would be a much better place to have that conversation. Great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah.
Thanks so much, Chris. Uh, great questions, by the way, and um, you know, going forward, we will uh, conduct a more detailed analysis, Oops. looking at economics, looking at site potential, uh, looking at some of the technical requirements for any number of these projects. Um, and if you'd like to sort of be more closely engaged with that, definitely reach out to working group members or reach out to Chris or my colleague Andy Belden over there, who's really leading the charge with all of you uh, in Northampton. So very, very exciting stuff, and thanks so much for that overview, Chris. Um, so as Chris mentioned, uh, we'd really like to hear from you. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, each of these projects are sketched out uh, on these boards around the room. Uh, you should have received uh, three little dots, stickers, uh, when you first walked in the door. Um, and we'd like uh, all of you to sort of, in the next moment or so, uh, stand up, uh, sort of head on over to one of these boards, and think about the projects that that you think are most compelling, based on um, some of the goals and vision that maybe we talk, talked about at the, at the first form, uh, and sort of prioritize with your, your dot um, the projects that you're most, most enthusiastic about. So you can take those three dots and you can put them all three on one project, you can spread them out with, uh, across a couple of projects. Uh, keep in mind, this is just a prioritization exercise, so that doesn't mean that anything is sort of ruled out or absolutely ruled in. It just helps us as we sort of go forward with uh, research on these projects. Uh, please uh, take the next few minutes. If you have additional questions or comments, I'd like to make you can uh, write them on the back of those boards. There's a marker and a facilitator there uh, who's happy to take that down. So great, thanks so much uh, for uh, going through the prioritization process. Uh, at the end of the evening, we'll report out sort of where uh, the greatest interest is uh, from this group regarding these uh, potential projects to develop in Um So moving on to our next uh, phase of the evening, uh, as I mentioned, the working group really identified four project areas that they thought were worth, worthy of a much more detailed discussion. And tonight's uh, sort of the first chance we get to uh, have some of that discussion with all of you in the community. Um, and so we've invited uh, four experts. Um, Mary Goldstein from the Center for Eco Technology will be working with us tonight uh, on energy efficiency. And sort of talking through what are the opportunities uh, for energy efficiency, uh, outreach marketing, uh, developments in Northampton going forward. Um, Catherine Finneran over here uh, from the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center will be speaking with you guys tonight around anaerobic digestion. So what are the, what is anaerobic digestion? Uh, what are the requirements for it? Um, what are some of the benefits? Does it make sense? And then also, I think, thinking through what are some of the concerns and then how should, what, what are some of your concerns about it? Uh, and uh, would it fit into Northampton uh, well or, or not? And so we'll sort of walk through some of those uh, concepts as well. Uh, Daniel Hall and Sarah Wein, excuse me, Weinstein uh, from MassDEP, um, where are you? There you guys are. Uh, we'll be speaking with you guys tonight about landfill solar. Um, and so they'll be back in this uh, corner over here. Um, and so thinking again through, there's a, there's a landfill in uh, Northampton, as, as we all know, uh, and landfill solar is a, a, a potential opportunity for development there. Um, so what are some of the pros, cons, and requirements uh, for that as well? And then lastly, Megan Ramey. Where's Megan? 
Uh, we'll be speaking to you about bike sharing programs. Uh, and so Megan's an expert on bike sharing, having worked on this topic uh, in Boston and uh, across the, the nation. Um, and so we'll be sharing with you again some of the pros, cons, uh, requirements uh, for, for bike sharing. Um, so keep in mind, guys, these experts are here to, to, to serve you, right? So uh, as you have questions or thoughts or considerations, make sure you articulate them. We additionally have uh, facilitators uh, from MCG who will be working with uh, each of these experts and with you to make sure we capture some of these uh, pro, con pros, cons, uh, or questions uh, that sort of need to be addressed as we, as we move forward here. Uh, so it's a great opportunity for uh, robust discussion and we, we look forward to having it with you. Um, so we have time this evening uh, to spend about 20 minutes with each, each expert. Uh, you'll be able to visit three of them, but uh, if you have additional questions, Make sure you reach out to us, and we'll also report on the results at the end of the night from all four sessions. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, we ask you to break up into four groups evenly, uh, and head on to these uh, four corners, uh, and then we'll let you know when to rotate, uh, and your facilitator and your expert will be available uh, to help you walk through the process. Thanks so much. And uh, I will be facilitating the conversation, recording all of your ideas, thoughts, concerns, pros and cons, uh, to gather as so much feedback as we can on, on what you, the community members, think about this type of project. Uh, uh, So, folks, if we could, um, so Sarah's going to start by giving an overview of Landfill Solar, uh, what it is, how it works, and a few features, and maybe if we could just hold questions at the end of, uh, spend the majority of the time answering questions. Okay. Um, first of all, I'm going to assume that this is such a knowledgeable group, and I'm going to get closer to this so that we can all hear it. Um, that you all know, I don't have to tell you this all the time. The issue is putting them on top of the closed line file. And there are, well, what I can tell you is that there are 14 of these projects now operating in Massachusetts. And there are probably about eight, seven or eight of those projects are in Western Mass. So, seven or eight. Um, I actually have a, uh, the numbers change almost every day. And we're already, those 14 projects are generating about 23 megawatts already. So, um, the things that make a good site for larger scale solar, not exactly bigger than what you put on your roof or, or a, a warehouse or something like that, you need a large open piece of land. It needs to be relatively flat. Um, it needs to be it's better if it's closer to the electrical grid, even though it is possible to run wires and just add us to the cost. And um, those are really the things that people look for in these sites. So close landfills, you know, if you make it a little bit closer to the grid, can provide really good sites for these projects. Um, you need a number of permits to do these projects. Mass DDP already has issued a permit to cap and close the Northampton Bay We need to issue a permit for any post-closure use, whether it's going to be the site of 
ball fields, soccer fields, parks, which a lot of like, places that you support elsewhere in the Commonwealth, or a project like this. So we're looking at how the use is going to be built and maintained so that at the end of the project, you still have the landfill cap doing what it's supposed to do and protecting us from the waste material that's in the So that's one premise of the relationship. You may have, if your landfill went to Nico to get built, you may have to go to Nico to get those projects. We really haven't run into too many projects that have to do that. Um, we have that on Monday. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you're going to need a permit to tie into the electrical grid. So we need to go to the utility, they need to prove it. Um, I think you need a comment from ISO New England also to tie into the power grid. Um, and it's the power generation approval, the ISO New England comment is a relatively straightforward thing to get, mostly because in terms of our big power plants, these are small projects. And so what they're looking at, they've got to worry about is this going to be a reliable connection in and out of the grid, depending on which way the power is going. And there's safety issues there. And then your electric utility needs to issue, which I think is national grid here, needs to issue a permit to connect and be an interconnection permit. What is the safety issue? Um, they have to make sure that it's all, all the wires are operating properly. It has to disconnect in place in the right way, or otherwise you can power it when it's down backwards and fill some of their line. It's, exactly. So that's, they're looking at their, they're looking at protecting their system, basically. And then municipalities have to issue building permits. And there are electrical permits that go with that because you're working with electricity lines. And in some cases, they're made depending on your landfill and dam knows that have that more specifics in Northampton than I do. Um, depending on your site and where how you're doing the work, you may need a wetlands approval from the contract. Yeah, we do have so that yes. right around. Right. So beauty of landfills though is by and large. When you put them up on top of the landfill, you're well out of the way. So you probably would not do that. I think some projects have run into issues where they've had to uh, build access roads. You know, the landfills have been dormant, packed and closed for years and years. So that's more of an issue. But that's just kind of full disclosure. This is kind of in general. Um, my question is because we do have to be very and also thought the closing of that landfill because of the odors and what happened with the health issues there. So that's why I'm pushing for this because I've done a tremendous amount of research. Well, I, I would like to know how much was consumed. You know, I, I actually don't know that because we don't get into the finance of it. But that would probably be pretty easy to find out by calling, by calling East Hampton. Um, actually, we've posted maybe you. Well, I don't. You're asking about the revenue from the yeah. sale of the electricity, correct? Yeah. Okay. yeah. And that's in the contract that they've written with the developer. Which basically, a lot of these projects are power purchase agreements. The city um, basically leases most of most of our landfills, but not all, are owned by the municipalities, and so they are basically leasing the land on top of the landfill. And in some cases, they don't lease the whole cap, but only a portion of it, and that's all delineated. And then they lease it to a developer, who, um, and they make arrangements to buy power back at a certain price. So that's sort of the way it all gets worked out. And has this ever been done to your knowledge that the municipality would actually do the purchasing and installation itself with the purchase of bonds and actually be the one to make the money rather than the developer, which gets more uh, confusing because they can't get the tax credits <coughs> because they're not a taxable entity. The municipality right. can't get the tax credits. Right. Right. Which is probably why it and usually makes more sense. And that's one of the attractions for getting the development. 
I'm not aware in Massachusetts of any projects that have gone in that direction. Um, actually, Meg Lusardi is probably more up on that one. I do know that there are towns that have looked at it, and when they've done math, they've decided that it's not worth it. It's easier, it's, I mean, towns don't, and well, long-term maintenance, and these are 20, 25-year power purchase agreements, so the town is also locking in. For the, it's not that you're shedding maintenance costs, or in Northampton's case, you haven't run into them yet because the closure's not done. But um, you, you're capping your costs. They're, they're steady, you're going to be steady. You agree on what they're going to be for the next 25 years. Well, usually when you, so, when you, get, you have a lease agreement, they do, the developer handles the maintenance of the specific array yes. itself. Yes. So, yes. And then it sometimes it goes a little beyond yeah. that. Yeah. Some, yeah. Of, some yeah. of the landfills, I mean, it's the town half of the ball right now. The developers call it. Oh, really? So, oh, okay. and then there are some towns where you know, Tampa is only one example. Greenfield's up and running, Ludlow's up and running. I think all of these deals are packaged somewhat differently. Yeah. And I think that there are different mixes of deals. Some of the towns may have given up uh, real estate tax income uh, in lieu of better rates on the electric side. Um, so, I mean, there's there different questions. ways to make yeah, there must be. That's and there I think if you folks were serious about it, I would just look at all the ones that are currently up and running. It's all public information. Um, I find that the DPW directors and the city councils talk pretty freely about themselves. Well, if you look at our of saying, well, the council, we wanted it, but I can see why they wanted it there, because it was an income in their pocket, it's about 22 to 23,000 a year. So we were able to, to at least have 23,000 a year in that landfill, which generates money. Out of that generating that money, I had them making sure the residents were taken care of, the roads were being paved. So there's always ways that you can work something out. So there is a tower, a cell tower? I have, oh, yeah, it's been there quite a long time. Next to Okay. 23,000 a year. <laughs> I'm sorry? Yeah, no, and if I, if I could, um, I just want to tell you about the things that we look at when we're reviewing permits. Um, and they're the same kinds of things we can look at for any post closure use. So um, we look at the foundation. Most of the solar projects don't go through the top layer of soil into the cabs. Um, but there's some construction, they need to build pads for transformers, and there are foundations for all of those arrays. And so we look at the design of those, and we look at how they're sited, and um, to make sure that as, as they build, that the cap is not going to be damaged. And it's, obviously, you have to see construction work, but that everything is going to get restored, and that they're going to be stable over time. Um, and we look at the stormwater controls because it's different to have a set of solar arrays than it is to have grass. And we look, we, we look at the plans um, for runoff control and make sure that it's all going to be managed so you're not going to be another problem. You're not going to be in a situation where over time the runoff will be directed in the radius of the road, the cap. Because that's not a good situation either. Um, the big issue is landfill gas. And we landfill gas. As the waste decomposes, it generates methane. And we've already, and we've already got a system in place, right? I, yeah, we've got that gas system here. Right. As well as the runoff there. And would that stay? It could stay. They have to get a contract. But the design of the solar arrays will have to work with that gas system. Or they have to work with the runoff. We had issues you don't want the owners because then you're going to have gas. You don't want the owners and you don't want them that lawsuit here because of this kind of problem. Exactly. So that's another issue, but that can be, that, it's something you just need to think about when you design your system. And then the last thing we look at, sort of in a big picture way, is um, what the long term maintenance is going to be for the system. 
and how that's going to work with the areas if, if you're not using the entire landfill to put solar arrays. You still have to do the mowing, you still have to maintain, make sure you're not growing trees out and the rest of it. And so you've got to still have access to get in there and you've got to have a plan for doing that. So those are the things that we look at when we look at these permits. We, when we first started, encouraging towns to look at renewable energy. I will also tell you that we have two wind turbines on close landfills. One's been up in the town of Hall and it's been operating since 2006. With not, it was the second wind turbine, new wind turbine in town. We were just talking about it before this got started. Ta and Paul got onto this clean energy kick a long time ago. There's, and I think both they started their, with their own sustainability discussions. Close, it's very similar to what we are doing. And the first thing that came out of that was, you know, there used to be a windmill because Hull is a coastal town. I don't know they have a point in Quincy Bay called Windmill Point. And there was a windmill there from the late 1880s until it came down to the storm in the late 60s. So they put a modern wind turbine back there, and that started generating enough electricity to power some of the town municipal buildings and some lights. And then they got so excited about that, they said, well, let's do another one, and looked around at available land, and the landfill was the best site. So they put the first wind turbine up on their close landfill, and that's been operating since 2006. Um, it it hasn't bothered the people at all, and it may be the particular site. So that, that's what I'm going to say. The second one was done in Kingston and went up with very with a lot of public support. And now that it's up, people are starting to have questions about noise and they're doing all this stuff. So most towns, we've sort of taken a step back and say, think about using these closed landfills for renewable energy. Most towns are looking at this because of the other issues. Because it's just close enough to a lot of neighborhood people who have already dealt with, you know, smell issues and stuff. I, I think they I think solar is a lot safer way to go there. So, I, what we, when we first started looking at this. Um, People were saying, oh my gosh, got to, get got to get a permit from SDP. That's a scary thought. I'll never get it. What's happening now is that the towns are setting up their contracts with their solar developers, for the most part. And they're coming in with, with solid waste consultants. And the permits, the applications have to be signed by the town because you own the facility, as well as signed by the professional engineer who's got a plan. Um, and they come to us first. It's our permits, and we put all of our approval letters up on our website, so you can go look at them. Um, the conditions are getting fairly standard, um, depending, obviously, some sites may have particular um, oddities that have to be dealt with. But um, they really are, we're looking at a standard set of things now. And so they're coming in to get our permit, and then the project, the developers go out and look for financing. Once they get financing, then they start talking to the utilities about the interconnection permits. And those interconnection permits have been the thing that is keeping a lot of these projects from actually under construction. The next DEP permit has a really nice thing. And Dan Kluth wrote the first one for the town of Greenfield. Unfortunately, that wasn't the first project to actually get up and run. Because of the financing and the interconnection. Right. Interconnection. So that's, I'm going to stop there. I'm, I'm wondering if, if you've heard back from any of the utilities. Now that more and more communities are starting to do these sizable projects, are they starting to become a little more hesitant? Because they're, like, they like power to be generated and used just perfectly flat, you know, on a flat rate. It, never, it doesn't happen like that. But obviously the spikes from the amount of uh, solar the electricity generated from solar is it peaks during the day and more during the summer and are they kind of getting more wary about having more and more of that? I wouldn't say it's getting more wary. 
I do. It is a consideration. Um, I would ask, have you done everything else? Yeah. Have you air sealed the rest of your house? Very be worried about brown house. Yeah. If you're heavily dependent on solar during the day, and the grid is versatile enough, versatile enough to make your income adjust quickly, right. the cloud goes over next to you, know you have to be brown house. So, big takes down to account for your house. Folks, uh, we have only a few minutes left before you all are going to rotate. This has been great questions and considerations. We've got a, a good list going already here. Uh, what I do want to hear is if there are folks who uh, you know, have been listening and forming an opinion of this, what, what do you all think of, of this idea? Is this, is this right for, for Northampton? Are there concerns? Okay, that's one vote. Other comments? Other comments? It all sounds good to me, but I'm wondering if there are any um, uh, cons out there that we have to So we don't have very many so far. Yeah, and uh, that you have mentioned some cons with the kid being the older and the No, the older was from the, from the dump from the old landfill, and I'm saying that there's enough neighbors around there that, yeah, would, would start really raising questions about the sound issue. Sarah, do you want to comment on that question? What are the cons of the sound uh, yeah. Cons really, by and large, are visual appearance. Uh, there was one built in Agawam next to a neighborhood that made some press and you could go and you could... All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, it's time yeah, to uh, transition. Uh, uh, rotate one camera the clockwise to the, to the next uh, group. <laughs> Yeah, the biggest issue is visual. Yeah, and there is no, at this point, there is no visual impact unless you're looking for it. The nice thing about Glendale Road is you really can't see the top of the landfill from anywhere. And to me, seeing that on a, on a rolling hill, that's beautiful. Yeah. Thanks. So, last but not least, uh, this is anaerobic digestion. My name is Chapman, and my students are smiling. This is my colleague, Captain Wright. Benefits from it as well. So just 
to get into how this process works, um, feedstock is what goes into the digester. And so feedstock can be, again, food waste. It can be fats and oils and greases, so stuff that comes out of the gum or the cane that's totally gross looking. It's actually very good for the digestion process. It helps with the biogas production. Um, manure, you see the cows here, manure um, is used, and this is common technology on um, dairy farms. One in Massachusetts and two uh, that are proposed are actually in Cat um, Yard waste, can be used in anaerobic digestion, manure, and of course wind water treatment. Uh, so that is the feedstock. And so before the, the feedstock goes into the digester, it has to be processed first. So that can happen on site if you have a room to have a processing on site. Um, this is what the schematic sort of shows what a processing facility might look like. It's a building, you tip the food on the floor, it gets macerated, uh, put into the digester. But either way, whether it's on site or off site, the material has to be processed to get it into the right consistency and take stuff out of it like forks and print, stuff that's going to gum up the digestion process, which is a very delicate um, biological. So the, the stuff is pre-processed, it's fed into the digester. The digester is an airtight container. It can look like a cylinder, it can look like this rectangular box. Um, anyone who's been to Jersey Island or Florida or Deer Island has seen these huge eggs. Uh, there are 12 of them, those are also digestible. They look a little different, but they act the same. Um, they are, there is, the feedstock goes in, there's uh, microorganisms that uh, basically digest the feedstock. It's an oxygen free environment, and as the uh, microorganisms digest the feedstock, it creates this biogas, creates the schematic um, that gets collected at the surface. And the digesters are maintained at a warm temperature, it's about a body temperature or higher, depending on the type of process type of digester you have, and if that happens for uh, 21 to 40 days, depending on what's in there and how hot it is. So um, the biogas is created, it collects at the top, and this biogas is really um, quite rich in methane, which is of course good from an energy point of view. Uh, so it's about 60% methane, which I believe is higher than landfill gas. So it gets collected, and then it gets hard piped, it never gets exposed to the air, hard piped over to um, either a gas turbine engine where it's combusting and creates electricity and heat in some cases, um, or a boiler where it gets combusted and creates heat. And that heat can be used for space heating to heat hot water. Um, a certain amount of that heat needs to go back into the digester itself to keep it at that constant warm temperature. There's also something, a, a liquid effluent that comes out of the digestion process called digestate. It's very nutrient rich. Um, and it comes out in a liquid form. It's separated into liquids and solids. And that actually has a value. It can be sold as fertilizer. Um, it can be used as solids. It can be put into an animal setting and pops. Um, there's more and more things uh, that they're coming up with for the solid form. The liquid fertilizer is very, very um, potent and it has proven value. So that can be sold. And that's an economic uh, benefit. So, what makes a good site for a digester? Um, looking for the book here. Um, so, a good site for a digester would be a site that would be um, at least four or five acres. It could be at your wastewater treatment plant, it could be at your landfill, it could be just on a blank slate of land. Um, but as long as it has at least four to five acres for the digester operation itself, and if you want things like the processing buildings or other, um, or to compost the stuff. Uh, you want that site to be right off the highway, essentially, because there are trucks that bring the feedstock into the digester. So to have a digester that's economically viable, uh, you need feedstock, a certain amount of feedstock to go into it, and that feedstock gets trucked onto the site. So the number of trucks can vary depending on the size, but you could be looking anywhere between 10 to 30 round trip trucks per day. Um, you don't want those driving through your neighborhood, you don't want those Downtown So um, have it near the highway. Don't have it too close to residential neighbors, especially from a visual standpoint. Um, 500 to 1,000 feet. Uh, you don't, of course, want it on that. These are sensitive uh, habitat areas, uh, and you want to make sure. And what Hampton's 
also here, that there is feedstock in the area. So a vendor, if they want to say one of these, they look 20 to 30 square miles radius and look at all the generators of uh, feedstock. So that would be things like hospitals and universities and restaurants and all the things you have in this five college area already. Um, and they would want some commitments, the vendors, that they could get the feedstock to um, to run this operation. Yeah, so, so do you want me to get into issues or take questions? I think we can go to questions. I, I have a lot of them. So the previous group certainly identified there's potential with uh, smell. The captain was saying that you want to make sure that a the facility has you know, negative air pressure, so there's no smell coming from it. You want to make sure that the trucks are the seal type of trucks, and there's no um, leakage as the trucks are driving on the road. Is, are there any resources available that sort of go through like what those types of requirements should be if a community is looking to do a project? Like, a checklist of make sure that your vendor does these, you know, 10 things? Yes, yeah. So there are um, actually through the Clean Energy Center, through our game energy program, you can get money for a feasibility study, which you want to do to, like, very carefully hire a consultant to look at your site. That money can be used to do some community outreach, get feedback from neighbors, um, and to start identifying concerns and ways to you know, requirements that the town or city, rather, would want in place if a digester or site is there. Uh, in our state regulations, we require things like an urban control plan, a road and control plan, things like that, um, that will be protected. But there are rodents. Ro uh, rodents. Ro oh, rodents. Oh, rodents. Yeah. Yeah. That's another concern. That's true, I think. Yeah. 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 So, so things like that. You want to make sure there's a plan, a solid plan in place, and, and that you know what those technologies are to eliminate any concerns. Uh, any questions? Yeah, that's true. Go ahead. Okay. So, the so the that's a good question. Um, so, there are a number of other um, digesters being looked at in this area, including at two farms in Mount Back, Deerfield, um, Deerfield, or Greenfield, UMass Amherst, um, and other areas. And, and the reason I bring that up is I have been involved in looking at the Amherst Waste Water Treatment Plant at UMass, and I have looked at the five colleges area. I looked at the feedstock there. So you think about the five colleges and you think like, oh, that's food waste, that's awesome, especially the math. But that is to, to make a um, commercial scale digester project viable, that would only be five to six percent of what's needed. It's a fairly small amount compared to what the digester is. But there's a um, actually a ban going into place next year on large generators of organic material. So hospitals over one ton per week. And that's going to create a lot more heat stock that can go into these areas. So you can, the answer to your question is, you can't in the surrounding area, all of that is your name. Wastewater treatment plant slash, you already have in your wastewater treatment plant. You probably don't want to truck other people who want to use it. They should have that. So there's definitely heat stock in this area that's a yeah, so that's going to create feed stock. Um, there are, you know, like UMass already it separates its food waste and sends it to a paper And I, I assume some of the other colleges do that as well. So, um, so it's essentially non-UMass people who are not already separated in food waste will be required to, and all of that will become available, and they're looking for a place to put it. Now, you can put it in anaerobic digesters. You can also put it into composting as well. There are a number of composters, I understand, in, um, in this area, Northampton, bring their material to the as well. So they're, they're both options, but from an energy standpoint, this is What's the link to a small agriculture? Like, how can this support small farmers, either as feeding in their waste products or receiving the benefits of their Yeah, that's a think that would be So it's, um, anaerobic digestion is quite often on farms. There's a farm in Rutland, a uh, dairy farm, it has 300 dairy cows. And so in that um, digester, is like a 500 kilowatt engine for the digester. In that case, the manure from the farm, which used to be an open lagoon and were like attractive nuisance, goes into the digester. They bring food onto the site from canes and cabin, I think. They go up and pump it into the digester with manure. Um, the electricity and heat that's produced is used on site. And then that liquid effluent is 
stuff that comes out of it is also used on the farm as fertilizer, and uh, other farms pay for that fertilizer as well. So it's actually a really good um, farm type application. There's another revenue stream through that. Uh, whatever it is. Right. Yeah, the yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 So it's perfect for, for dairy farmers. Yeah. Um, so to my agency, Clean Energy Center, there is um, the first thing you want to do is a feasibility study. So I will consult and look more carefully at the study. They do community outreach. I want to make sure the community is comfortable with what this is. People a lot of times think, well, this is like a dump. Um, it's not. You don't classify this as a solid waste facility. Um, so you want to take a very careful look and do the community outreach. If you decide to go forward, um, we give construction grants from my agency to, to build. So if you need other sources of funding, we give us thousands to actually construct. A lot of private companies, um, so you could be both. Uh, if you wanted to own it, the, the city, you could do that. Um, but a lot of times a private vendor would come in, like in Bourne. Bourne wants a digester at their landfill. Um, and Bourne is in a, uh, entering into a contract with a private vendor, Harvest Power. There are a number of them in this area, state. But Harvest Power is one. Um, and through a power purchase agreement, they're going to cite the digester, they're paying for everything, harvest, they're taking care of all the costs and the permitting, um, they're, they're going to be on the landfill site, and um, and then they through the power purchase agreement, they give electricity to the uh, town at a reduced rate. There are different models. Yeah, I mean, the most popular thing that is better in terms of being strong, there's a lot of more So, from that point, they can really, they can be everywhere. They're used on farm, on the 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 farm, on but, um, but they can be involved. The feedstock is really important, and there's a lot of feedstock in the population here. Please wrap up, y'all, and uh, come back. Uh, the number four most uh, prioritized project was an uh, evaluation of low-impact hydroelectric power uh, for Northampton. So this is uh, number four most popular. Uh, number three was to implement uh, the property says clean energy uh, bond program, so the PACE program. Uh, number two uh, was to evaluate solar on local landfills. I got about 14 votes. Uh, and the most popular one, with a whopping 28 votes, uh, was uh, exploring options for public transportation uh, in uh, Northampton. So very interested to see those results. Um, I think it's safe to say that public transportation will make it into uh, the, the clean energy roadmap. Unless the working group, I can't imagine what the working group would do. <laughs> so that was a very interesting result. Thanks so much for participating. Um, but to wrap up, let's um, briefly hear from each of our facilitators who will summarize the results of uh, the conversations. Let's start with the chat. No more shuttling around to line. Thanks, Neil. Um, thanks again to uh, Catherine, who introduced the exciting world of anaerobic digestion. We had great turnout and very exciting and thoughtful questions throughout. Um, as you can see from my board, I like these nice, organized, straight lines. Um, but if we sort of we talked about the size requirements and how it's actually quite a good fit in Northampton, given your access to highways and four to five acre sites that are available. There are a number within the community that seem feasible. Um, we talked a lot about what the output is in terms of clean energy and size and what the potential size of the project is and how that would benefit uh, both in terms of economic development, waste diversion, and the production of clean energy. We talked a lot about costs, so how much does it cost, um, what are the operating costs, what kind of trucks are out there, what kind of trucks would be driving, and then also what some of the other examples are in Massachusetts. So there are a number of 
facilities that are going in within the region, and so there may be opportunities to partner with other sites, anaerobic digestion sites, or also if a site was built in North Hampton to bring in waste from other uh, communities or in a collaborative way. Um, and then um, finally uh, pointed out that there are great resources at the Mass Clean Energy Center to sort of go through and, and do a, a feasibility analysis of what would work and then what the requirements would be of, an, of a vendor to make sure that they're operating the facility in an appropriate way and avoiding any of the uh, cons or concerns that, um, that, that could potentially come up. So um, with that, I will pass it on to uh, my colleague Jason. Great. And uh, for, so uh, our group talked about energy efficiency. For those of you that were fortunate enough to join us and hear Marin speak uh, and have him answer your questions, um, he highlighted the opportunity, uh, particularly in heating and lighting. Uh, 30 to 40 percent of our energy use is, uh, goes into heating and cooling, and another 11 percent into lighting. Um, and we've got a lot of really great programs here. Um, particularly the Mass Safe program, which is actually the number one energy efficiency program in the country, which is pretty exciting. Um, there are a few challenges. Um, there's, uh, it's difficult to obtain some of the energy data from the utility companies. Um, there's some complexity issues associated with large buildings, um, as well as uh, financing um, some of the more in-depth uh, types of projects. Um, there were a number of questions um, around uh, how, what kinds of questions do you ask a property manager if you're uh, in a bigger building. Um, also talking about uh, energy concierge, is there an energy concierge for residents, um, at different outreach programs, uh, and just a number of comments as well too. Um, some of the primary targets um, that, uh, that, that, that uh, Marin and his team are looking at are, are lighting, air sealing, and insulation and energy efficiency. So, great, with that, pass it on to Christina. Thanks, Jason. Top um, I led the and in partnership with uh, Megan, who was our expert. Uh, my group discussed the bike sharing program, and in general, uh, everyone was very positive about the concept of programs, um, particularly because of their convenience um, and the flexibility that they offer. But the big question was, is a bike sharing program relevant for Northampton? And given its size, given uh, the density, um, would it, is it something that makes sense or not? Uh, so that was a big item that we discussed today, as well as um, a couple technical aspects around uh, safety and um, you know what, uh, what are some of the specific requirements that are really necessary to make it successful here in this community. We also discussed um, some of the different types of cost models and structures that uh, could be suitable and uh, what would be relevant here in this community. And um, in general, um, I would say the big question is, is, does it make sense here for this community um, or not? And if so, um, I think Northampton would be particularly excited to have some sort of a regional share, um, potentially with Amherst, um, now that the bike path is being uh, refixed and repaved and given all the congestion on uh, Route 9 corridor that, you know, sort of a more regional approach uh, could potentially be the better option if it's explored further. John. Thanks, Christina, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, we had a great presentation uh, by Sarah and uh, Q and A by Sarah and Dan. Uh, a lot of I won't go over the requirements because you you heard a lot of them. Um, but I think the key message is that one of the pros is that uh, this is becoming fairly standard. In the early days, there were a lot of hurdles. People didn't necessarily know what they were doing, um, and and that could delay or even uh, ruin some projects. But now it's it's becoming something that has a lot of precedent, and now in Northampton can benefit from the fact that others have gone up that learning curve. Uh, and the process has be, become streamlined, particularly with uh, DEP permitting. Uh, another advantage is uh, there's a lot of different revenue models. Uh, in most cases, uh, the project is put out to RFP, and a developer pays the upfront cost and or pays a, um, a fee for use of the site. Um, there is options also for the city to own it, and there's a lot of different models that could be explored there. Uh, so there's potential to be a revenue source for the city either way. Um, some of the cons, uh, many of them uh, we, dis we discussed are, are not do, do not seem to be concerns up front, but not real issues once the project is built, uh, such as transformer noise. Well, there's noise from other things, and generally you can't even hear it at the, the, the border of the site. Um, the costs, uh, you know, there's, there's revenue models to, to address that. Uh, visual appearance, uh, you know, again, it's, it's far enough away from, uh, from neighbors 
uh, or that may not be a concern for some demographics. So, so many of the issues that, um, in other communities uh, that do not, don't seem to be relevant. Some of the key questions, uh, Sarah and Dan did a great job of explaining the what and the why. So a lot of them revolved around the who, the when, the how, and of course the how much. Um, and I think we, uh, we went over that, uh, and it's getting late, so I won't go into a lot of detail there. Uh, but these uh, are giving us a great set of questions to dig into uh, as we move forward with the roadmap, uh, and then also uh, issues to flag for any potential proposal that's put forward in the future. So thanks again for all of you for coming. I'll turn it back to Neil. Great. Thanks so much to all of you. Um, and thank you to our experts, and I think also to yourselves. I listened to a number of the sessions. You guys did a great job, I think, collectively in sort of thinking through these options and opportunities and asking sort of smart, compelling questions. Um, so I think we should all give yourselves a round of applause. And, uh, <laughs> so looking ahead, uh, what will happen next is uh, the results from these sessions will be aggregated uh, and presented to uh, the working group for further review. Uh, they'll provide additional direction regarding uh, where they'd like to see research happen, uh, and uh, an outline will begin to emerge for uh, the uh, roadmap for Northampton. If any of you have any questions or concerns uh, or uh, new ideas or suggestions uh, to consider for the roadmap, I highly encourage you to get in touch with Chris Mason um, or additionally reach out to any of the uh, working group members. Uh, you welcome your input. Uh, this is your roadmap and uh, really sort of needs your input and, and suggestions and support to, uh, to be effective. Um, that's it for this evening. Again, thank you so much and I hope you have a, a great rest of the week. Combination with the trip, but it's a lot of people. 
So that was another good statistic. Um, Hubway saves um, people on average of 45,000 hours of treatment. Um, so if you choose one year, yeah. But yeah, it's pretty. Um, I think Sierra was making this a big deal. This campaign is very much in the past, and we got lots of support for it. I don't know if it's going to be a big deal. So I don't know if I wouldn't be more than 20 or 30, which is really small. But that makes sure that each other's population is going on. I'm not sure if it's going to want to make sure that they have a big deal. I think I safely guesstimate it to be under a million dollars startup. But then you have the ongoing staff and operations. So that's just a guesstimate though. It's possible. It's not, I mean the user fees are very, very small in terms of what that pays. Are companies that contract in the system or is the yep. city set up an apartment or not? Well, no, sometimes it's the, it depends on how you set it up. Like, if you raise the cost, I just didn't want to fill the traffic, the volume, and the type of traffic that you don't have as a place of service. And also, there's a whole cycle that comes out. So, there are different types of traffic that you can see. I think there's a lot of things that got rid of here with work the colleges and universities and it's some company, whether it's a sponsor or an entity that wants to see if it will work at the scale or between the inter-region and the municipalities that are like we are now. They would make sure that the vendors would be able to do that. And the funding would come from a bunch of towns and the university system, the college network, and then of course, I'm sure it's going to be this area and come with their housing and all that. There's a lot of benefits.
it's like brainless, and that's why it's so convenient. You can really just hop on and assist. I mean, there's men all over Boston that are biking in blue suits. They don't have to worry about chain grease getting on Yeah, yeah, so a lot of people bring their own helmets with them, but there's also a whole vending machine being tried on the track, partnership with MIT. And there are temporary helmets that get sanitized. Then there's directions to go buy cheap helmets at your home to get the vendor. So, yeah, there are kinds of problems. It's like that's the whole thing. Maybe I can change. That's a lot of material what you know. Yeah, you can land that contract. That's an ideal circumstance. There's certainly a difficulty getting to these rights. So, I think it's a tough thing to talk about.
Please wrap up, y'all, and... Uh...